A busy street in the centre of a typical UK city. This is Manchester, but it could be Liverpool, Nottingham, London or Southampton. Half of the people in these pictures will suffer a premature death. Their lives will be shortened by up to 12 years for one overriding reason. It's not because of their age. It's not whether they are able-bodied or disabled, or because they are black, white, Asian or Chinese. It's nothing to do with their sexual orientation. All of these are important factors which can affect an individual's health but none of those account for half the population. No, there is another reason why so many are more likely to die earlier. A reason why they're more likely to have accidents or to take their own life. A reason they're also likely to develop heart disease and die of heart attacks and strokes. They are less likely to develop some cancers than individuals in the other half of the population. Yet, they are more likely to die of those same cancers once they have them. They're also more likely to be obese and develop obesity-related illnesses, even though the other half of the population have a much higher awareness of their weight and are more likely to eat well and exercise. So why is this? What is different about these individuals is that they are at risk of poorer health simply because they happen to be men or boys. The key thing to really fix in your head is that there's pretty strong agreement that there is no biological reason why that should be. There is a debate about whether men will ever live as long as women, but the extent of the difference, um, there's no really convincing biological reason why men should die uh, four years earlier than women. Not only does male life expectancy vary radically across the 27 European countries, more importantly for the purposes of today, the gap between men and women also varies very significantly. So, and even between countries that share borders. In 2011, we had the first State of Men's Health report produced. It was for the European Commission. Uh, I was very proud to head up the team, 36 academics from across Europe working on this report. Some very key findings from it. One of them is the fact that men have a high level of premature death. 630,000 men die between the age of 15 and 64 across Europe in any given year. You compare that to 300,000 women, you realise that more than double the number of men are dying. So there is no uh, really convincing biological reason. What we know is that the difference in life expectancy uh, and in uh, morbidity between men and women, much of that is to do with cultural, behavioural and lifestyle factors. And the point about those factors, in our view, is that they can be changed. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So these are the extent to which uh, uh, incidents or cause of death for these conditions exceeds women in men. So you'll see that uh, this is 2.5 times, for example, the likelihood that a man will die at those ages. So you see that for all of those conditions, um, men are more likely to develop them um, at, obviously those bars are grouped by age. One of the biggest factors about how long we live is to do with social class, and this takes, or economic status, and this takes the two local authority areas with the highest life expectancy in the country, Kensington and Chelsea, and the lowest, which is Glasgow City, and you'll see very significant differences uh, between the longest-lived men and the longest-lived women. So we know, obviously, that there are other factors at play, but, but the important thing about the social class gradient or the economic gradient is that when you look at the data, and I haven't got a graph to show you this now, you'll have to take my word for it, is that the, uh, the, from the least well-off to the most well-off, the, the um, graph is steeper in men, so the gap uh, is starker in men between the, between the most and least well-off. We find a very similar and worrying picture in the UK as we have found across Europe. 
You look at the poorer areas of the country, you look at Manchester, you look at Glasgow, some estates in Glasgow, the life expectancy is on equivalent to Lithuania, Latvia. You look at other places like Chelsea um, and, and Westminster in London, and they are up uh, equivalent to the Iceland. And so what we're seeing is this massive disparity. And in fact, the difference between men and women's life expectancy is less than the difference between men and men's life expectancy, depending on their socioeconomic circumstances. Disparities in deaths between the, in Europe and those we find within the UK are similar in that so much that men across Europe have higher rates of cancer, higher rates of cardiovascular disease, higher rates of liver disease. It's the scale. Um, so therefore, men have a higher rate of, of deaths from lung cancer in Lithuania and Latvia, as we do. It's just the numbers are so much greater in their countries than they are in here. Uh, same with uh, liver disease, same with um, diseases of the bowel, etc., etc. We know that men tend to know less about health than women. So uh, men are, uh, know less about symptoms, they know less about illness prevention and so on. So I think that's, that is pretty well established. There's a bit of a debate about whether men really seek medical help later um, in the development of symptoms, but certainly that's very widely believed by clinicians. I think the data is a bit less convincing than you might expect, but it certainly it's very, very widely believed that men will wait longer before seeking help. Um, and we know that men are less likely to follow health promotion advice and to engage in, I put in risky behaviour in inverted commas because we can come back in a minute if you like to what actually is risk. But we know that of, of the identified risks to health, men are more likely to take risks uh, than women. That it's, we, because women are more likely to look at and study health information, there's inevitable drift towards producing information that's suitable for women. And I, I know that men are regarded as really quite hard to reach, um, which is ridiculous, really, because we make up almost half a population. You know, you go throw a stone and there'll be a bloke there, you pass him in the street. So there are plenty of blokes around. But there is a tendency, I think, that if you think a group of people are not going to take much notice of what you say, then there's a tendency to just speak to the group of people who you think will take notice of what you say. So I think there is a sense in which we, our information is better directed at women, but clearly men are less interested in having you got to look at women's... Sorry, Shana, are you going to say something as well? No. You need to look at the media. You know that there's, an, a, there's a constant kind of interest in health among women, and that isn't reflected in men. So there is a sense, too, that we've got to try to change the way men think about their health. But that is our responsibility uh, in the NHS. We can't just simply say, well, there's a bunch of people there who are less interested in their health. Our argument would be we've got to find out how to engage those people about their health. That's one of the things that we've got to do, and we don't do that very well at the moment. I work for Trafford PCT and uh, some of our public health team have been over to Manchester United's uh, ground there and what they found which was very interesting for me was that um, when you do engage men about health issues they are very interested in it. The only problem for us we were funding that bit of work but most of the people weren't Trafford residents. If we'd been having this discussion 10 years ago I'd have sold you smoke, I'd have worked with mirrors because we didn't have any real evidence base, because there was no men's health. Men's health didn't exist as an issue. If you'd gone into any bookstore, you would have seen very, very little to do with men's health. And if there was anything on men's health, it would have been about bigger pecs, better sex, pecs and sex, sex without pecs, pecs with sex. It would have been all those kind of things, the men's health magazine of health. Okay? Things have changed. I've now got better evidence base that we can do something about it. And that evidence base tells me that if you were to do X, Y, and Z, you can expect A, B, and C as an outcome on these. So for instance, if you go into the workplace and if you actually get men to talk to their mates about health issues, they are much more likely to do something about those health issues. That is evidence based. That's not just Ian Banks saying it's a great idea. We now know it works. So by going where men are, by utilising, for instance, the trade of which they are proud, for instance, as a hook to health, you'll find they will work much better in terms of early diagnosis.
the, the um, evidence is that women, well, women are certainly in primary care more frequently, even if you exclude uh, visits associated with uh, having children. And of course, there are more uh, screens for women as well. That's just by scientific chance, but that, that is the way it is. Um, and also, I think, as it's historically, it's typically been mothers who take responsibility for children's health. So, um, so that, you know, as a man, once, you know, once you kind of leave home or you go away to be a student or whatever it might be, then you're kind of much more on your own in trying to sort out your health uh, than uh, many young women are. So there are, so there are a number of explanations, but these are cultural explanations and, and they are things that we can change. Where, where there is an overlap between um, health and appearance, I mean, particularly you think about uh, weight, then it is, it is right. I think in some ways the, the sort of emphasis on physical appearance in terms of having a healthy weight has been very damaging for women. And I think that actually it's becoming damaging for young men because as there are more and more uh, young men presenting now with, with dysmorphic body disorders. Uh, and I think actually that's really quite unhelpful. We need to get to proper understanding for both men and women, and we'll talk about this when we talk about obesity, a proper understanding of, uh, in both men and women about why our health is important. There really are only two basic explanations. One is that men don't take care of their own health as well as they could do. And the second is, and this is the point we were just making, is that services are less effective at providing uh, advice, support, treatment and care to men. There are, those are the only two possible explanations, really. Of course, they overlap, uh, but th it's within those two sort of parameters that we're going to just talk about now, why isn't men's health as good as it could be? So I just remind us of these things about what do we think about men's health. They don't know as much as women, they delay seeking help, um, and they're less likely to follow advice. Just to remind us of those. So this compares, this graph compares um, three harmful behaviours, uh, smoking, um, alcohol consumption and poor diet. And you'll see these are men here on the left, uh, women on the right. And you see that men exhibit uh, more of those uh, behaviours and take the point that I was making earlier, this, this is grouped by income and you'll see that the less well off you are, the more likely uh, for both men and women, but it's more marked for men, the more likely you are to have these behaviours. So we know that and these are examples, obviously smoking, alcohol consumption, diet, but there are plenty of other self-damaging behaviours. And so we know that men are more likely to um, have those um, lifestyle causes of poorer health. This compares women in red there with men in green. Uh, and this is about awareness of symptoms. When people are asked unprompted to name cancer symptoms, and you'll see that women typically can name more cancer symptoms uh, than men. So men uh, probably do know less about uh, symptoms. This looks at the rate ratio uh, of male to female cancer incidence. Now, <clears throat> along the bottom, which is the naught row, that's where the bars would be if incidence was equal for men and women. And many people don't realise this, but all of the 10 cancers which are not spec specific, men are more likely to develop those cancers at all ages. All those cancers, with one exception, which we'll talk about. Um, so, if you take, for example, if you look along here, the, if you, probably the best thing is just to read the orange bars, which are all ages, the other two are different ages. So if you just look at the orange bars, you'll see uh, that, for example, if you take, I'll see one that I can read here, esophageal cancer, men are 2.5 times as likely to develop that cancer at any age than women. So all of these cancers, uh, men are more likely to develop than women. Just, just, just to, and this is, this is all cancers excluding the sex-specific ones. So if you look at the all one here, it's a bit confusing because it suggests that um, actually the ratio is much closer than it is. Once you take out the cerv cervical cancer and breast cancer, um, then you'll see that actually the ratio between men and women increases uh, particularly. And this also takes out lung cancer because that's much more common in men. So even if you take out lung cancer, you'll see that cancer incidence in men exceeds cancer incidence in women. The only one where uh, cancer incidence in men doesn't exceed in women is melanoma. That's the only one of the top 10. You'll see that there. But if we look here, uh, and this is, looks right across Europe, you'll see this is the same here. Uh, men are in blue, women are in red. So as we just saw, uh, melanoma, malignant melanoma, is more common, occurs more commonly in men than women. That's the in um, women than men, that's this chart here. If you look on the other side, you see that men are more likely in every European country to die of malignant melanoma, even though they're less likely to get it. And that's 
evidence suggesting that men tend to present later uh, in the development of symptoms. We've just brought out a report on cancer in men with Cancer Research UK. Um, one of the startling fa facts is the fact that men have a 37% higher risk of dying of cancer. And if you take out the breast and the sex-specific cancers, men have a 67% higher risk of dying of those cancers, therefore, which should affect men and women equally. And it's not just the fact that men are turning up late or they are uh, somehow being negligent with their treatments or it, it's the fact that they're also nearly 60% higher risk of developing those cancers. And so we've got to look at the causes of those cancers and why men seem to be so much more vulnerable. A lot of men don't realize that their beer bellies, their overweight abdomens, also has a cancer link. The fat-related cancers are of a sign growing significance. Inactivity has been linked to cancer risk. S sedentary behavior has been linked to cancer risk. It's, so there's a multitude of factors that are making men vulnerable in a way that um, many men just don't realize. There are very few books for men on health as they grow up. Um, unfortunately, we tend to, to look at health as simply a woman's um, issue. Why should women have to look after the health of men? That's discrimination. Why should women have to do it? Why should women have to give up their careers, for instance, to look after the elderly widowed father? Why do men not look after them? We need to share the responsibility of health. But you can't do that if you don't look at the barriers for men to be able to do that job in the first place. So if there's not the kind of literature, if there's not the kind of information out there, don't be surprised if men have very little insight into what health is all about, and especially sexual health. Most boys pick up their messages from their mates, and their mates know even less about sex than they do but boys are fascinated by sex and don't have the information upon which to act so don't be surprised for instance when we ask young men as we have done um, a choice of what chlamydia is for instance don't be surprised if more than half of them actually say oh it's an edible shellfish don't laugh two of them actually said it was a greek island don't be surprised. It's not the men's fault. It's not the boy's fault. It's the lack of education. It's the lack of insight that was providing them. That's the problem. I tried to write an article some years ago, and I just decided to, uh, which was about help seeking, I decided that just out of interest to ring some of the major national charities which run helplines, I did ring more than this but these are some examples, and asked them what, where they kept records, what percentage of their callers were male and what percentage were female. And you see that typically it's less than a third of callers to these helplines um, are male. So women are more likely to seek, seek help than men. I then rang, I thought it would be interesting to ring Prostate Cancer UK as they're now called and ask them how many of their callers were women and almost a quarter of callers to, ca uh, to Prostate Cancer UK are female, obviously they don't have prostates, so they're calling about their uh, husbands or their spouses and partners. So I then rang Breast Cancer Care to ask what percentage of their callers are male and only 4% of those callers are male. So you can see here again there's something which there's a bit of evidence for the idea that actually men are less interested and less motivated around health are less likely to seek help. Another great myth about men and use of the services that men don't go to see the doctor. And this is patent nonsense. The problem is, is that for many men, particularly low income group men, particularly for men in isolated communities and so on, they tend to go late. They tend to go later rather than sooner. So what we find, for instance, that although conditions may be more common in, for instance, women, men will actually suffer more. Melanoma, classic example. In every country in Europe, more cases of melanoma in women, but more deaths in men. What we've got to do is find out what are the barriers for men going to see a health professional. When we understand the barriers, then we can understand how we can overcome them. Then we can start to actually get men sooner rather than later. The key is early diagnosis. If we can't have prevention, go for early diagnosis. This is a bit of information about obesity and overweight. Now, you all work in health, so I expect you already know this, uh, but when I talk to people who are lay people, they really don't know this, that men are much more likely 
in the UK, men are much more likely than women to be obese or overweight. Uh, and people are often absolutely amazed by that for the reason colleague here just identified, which is there's such a huge emphasis everywhere uh, on the physical appearance of women, that, and, and of course women are very strongly associated with weight loss, um, that people are often amazed to find that, uh, that more men uh, are overweight than women. Why are more men overweight than women? Well, these, some of these things reflect what I was just telling you about. We know that men know less about diet and nutrition. We know men are less likely to eat a healthy diet, as I already showed you. Men are much more likely to drink alcohol to excess. Men, and these are the interesting things, men are much less likely, at least when they're interviewed, to express concern about being overweight. So typically, I don't know if it's typically, but it's a common reaction to ask men in research, what do you think about your weight? To which the answer will be, I'm not bothered about it. And you, that's not an answer you very typically get for women. And we also know that men are more likely to completely fail to notice that they are overweight. And there's been some very, very good research done. I can see you're all laughing because you usually recognise this. You would say, but there's been some very, very good research done which shows that um, men who uh, are overweight, when asked to describe their weight, say, oh, I'm about normal. And whereas women who are of normal weight ask the question about their weight, how would you describe themselves? Very typically reply, I'm overweight. So there's a very significant and marked difference between the genders there. So we've got men saying at least, they're not concerned about their weight, certainly not noticing that they are overweight, and then obviously denying that it's a problem. A very typical thing in, in research to ask men, well, does your weight affect you in any way? Oh no, I'm I might be carrying a bit of extra weight, weight, that's what you expect at my age, but I'm still pretty fit. It doesn't make any difference to me. So. So we, kn we know that there are these cultural differences in attitude. I chose obesity and weight here, like I'm going to choose mental health in a minute, just simply to give you an example. And you'll see these similar patterns repeated around other aspects of health. <clears throat> if you knew that one section of the population was significantly more likely to suffer from a particular condition than another, you would expect that services would reflect that as a very simple sort of equality based question there. Uh, if you've got one group are more likely to get something, you'd expect those people to be the people who are uh, concentrated on when we're trying to do something about it. Well, we know that obesity increases the risk uh, uh, in, uh, of all these conditions here. All of these conditions, particularly poor sperm quality, are more common in men. So we know that uh, so we know that, um, and actually uh, erectile dysfunction, which is uh, it's not on that list, but we know that uh, obesity affects all of these things. We know that men are more likely to be overweight, overweight and obese. Actually, the obesity figures are broadly similar for men and women. It's the overweight where there are more men. Um, so we know all of those things. But if you look at services, um, Women are much more likely to have been weighed in primary care compared with men. Uh, BMIs appear on the medical records of women much more commonly than men, but most telling of all, if you look at weight loss programmes commissioned by or delivered in primary care, very typically less than 30% of participants are male. So what you've got here is a group, a massive group of the population, in all senses of the word, um, who uh, are, are likely to suffer from this particular condition, but are less likely um, to be engaged in the treatment of that condition. So there's a genuine uh, e equality issue uh, here. Many men don't realise there's more men overweight than women. And for women, the fat tends to be on the hips and thighs. It's called the gynoid, the, the pear shape. Men tend to be apple shaped, the beer belly, the abdominal fat. The problem for men is this abdominal fat is not just an inert lump of lard. It is uh, an organ that's secreting nasties, and it uh, increases the risk of diabetes. It increases the risk of high, high blood pressure, hypertension, increases the risk of high cholesterol levels, increases the risk of developing the fat-related cancers. It's also been linked to erectile dysfunction. So this this growing uh, abdomen that we're all now at risk of. Nearly 70% of British males are now overweight or obese. And, and so that is a significant risk now that we're having with our health because of the way we are uh, expanding our proportions. 
we tend to see men as the underdogs in lots of ways when it comes to, to health. But actually, in some ways, men have got an advantage. You know, it's not sexist to talk about this. It just happens to be a fact that women tend, for instance, to put weight on all over. They were on the thighs, on the bum, all over they tend to put the weight on. So when you lose weight, it looks very gradual. You might lose a lot of weight, but you don't actually see it because it's everywhere that they're losing it. Men, on the other hand, tend to put weight on in only two main places, round the gut, the big one, and round the neck. And that's why if you measure a man's neck size, you'll know how much weight he's put on or, or has lost. And in particular, if you measure round the gut, then you really find out how, how much a man um, has lost weight now. Cosmetically, it looks as though a man is losing weight much faster than the way women lose weight because it takes a long time for the woman to appear that she's losing weight, which of course is an awful lot of the reason why you put losing weight in the first place. It's cosmetic. For men, if you can get men started into weight loss, they see the results very, very quickly. And the biggest way, of course, they see it is the notches on the belt are going down progressively. And every man knows exactly which notch his belt fits into, knows it. And when it suddenly starts to tighten up and go to the next notch and to the next notch, and when especially you start to put the screwdriver into the belt to get a new notch, it is an immense feeling of, uh, of satisfaction that you can actually see this working. Now, getting that message across to men is very important because they see this thing as going to be a long, hard struggle. Actually, when you can get them started, especially buddy up with their mates, donate a notch for every notch they don't they they lose donate it to charity give the food that you would have eaten to some starving kids in another country for each notch that you're losing on your belt but buddy up guys get the whole practice working on this together get all the men's buddied up together to donate notches off their belts because men will work as teams when it comes to issues like this and you can really kick into the male psychology by buddying them up not just treated as an individual treated as a team working together for their own benefit and for the benefit of other people so even though for example men are more likely to be overweight or obese than women uh, in terms of national policy on obesity there's virtually nothing there about gender differences. It's as if those, those differences don't exist. And the same would be true of cardiovascular disease. In other areas, it's been very hard to make an impact, even though many more men die of uh, cardiovascular disease uh, than women, and particularly at a younger age. So what we need to do is to find a way of driving change across all these big policy areas. We have... What's helped us in recent years has been the equality legislation and the Equality Act, or the, the two Equality Acts. Um, and that's, that has helped, that certainly has helped. But again, it hasn't been the effective driver for change that we hoped when that legislation first passed. It has resulted in something very patchy. Uh, some areas, like the Northwest, actually have done better than others in responding to uh, the spirit of the legislation. Um, but we can't rely just on that. I think said our main focus and our trust around men's health is the eating disorder services and looking at how we can encourage more young men to access that service. I think that, that, that needs to look at how we actually recruit men into the NHS and actually looking at the people that design the services actually understand men's issues and particularly young men's issues and men from different backgrounds such as BME, South Asian, the Gypsy and Traveller community and, and hopefully actually by working with organisations like the Men's Health, uh, the men's health Forum um, and other organisations we can actually get a better understanding of their needs and change our services appropriately. Um, I think so particularly Gypsy and Traveller um, men actually don't tend to engage with services particularly well. I know from working with some of our health visitors that they have built relationships up with women within the um, Gypsy and Traveller community but they've really struggled to actually access the men and actually get them involved in services a just to talk and have a conversation with some of the health practitioners never mind actually going on to actually access services so I do think there's actually real work that needs to be done there. Well, I'm going to talk about mental health now. I, I chose this little poem from Thomas Hardy because in a way um, it 
describes what we think is the key issue around male mental health. And I've been doing a lot of work in mental health in recent years. I've written two reports for the Department of Health and I've been putting together an academic network of psychologists um, interested in looking at whether there are male specific mental health needs. We know that psychosis, psychotic illness is diagnosed um, more or less equally between the sexes. But the common uh, mental health conditions, common mental disorders such as depression, anxiety, phobias and so on, they're much more commonly diagnosed in women. So when we were talking earlier about the common uh, conditions and I was saying to you, well, th these are all more common in men, I was talking about physical conditions, but if you, at first sight, if you look at psychological health, you would say, well, actually, in the case of psych psychological health, women are doing less well than men. However, Although men are less likely to be diagnosed with uh, psychological difficulties, if you look at what we might call the societal indicators of poorer mental health, you'll see that typically many things are much more common in men. You all know that three quarters of suicide, I'm sure all know that three quarters of people who take their own lives are male, but three quarters of people who go miss, of adults who go missing from home never to be seen again are men. 90% of people sleeping on the streets are men. I'm not going to read through the entire list, but men are more likely to abuse alcohol, they're more likely to abuse drugs, they're more likely to die uh, of uh, drug misuse. Virtually everyone in prison is male. Me boys are doing less well in school uh, than girls and have been for about 20 years. This is very, very important because we know that uh, a higher level of education is associated with better health throughout life. So. If you look at these range of things, you might say, and I guess this is debatable, but this is the position that the, the academic group I'm working with is taking at the moment, is that actually we probably are missing psychological distress in men uh, for a variety of really quite complicated reasons. And um, I've just done these two pieces of work, which I mentioned a moment ago for the Department of Health, one in partnership with uh, mind but what they these two pieces of work do is firstly look review what the evidence around men's mental health and then secondly look at what we might recommend as good practice to better engage with men around their mental health and <clears throat> the conclusion the sort of basic conclusion that we're working to is this um, that there are particular mental health needs in men they're associated with the fact of being male um, and it's perfectly possible to argue uh, that being male is a, is, a, is, a, is a predisposing factor towards a number of psychological health conditions, but we're not picking those up as well as we might, and we're not offering the kind of treatment services um, that are helping men. So this is less clear, in a way, than the thing I was talking to you about, obesity and weight, but there is, I think, a case to be made that we've we really aren't reaching out and our mental health services are not working as effectively with men um, as they might do. Quite a lot of the information was really interesting, particularly the sort of urban myth, if you like, that men don't tend to take much action over their own health. The uh, trust that I currently work for, uh, we have three prisons on our patch and what we've actually found is the opposite of that, that um, men, when they're in the <coughs> excuse me, prison system, actually do take a lot of time to go and see to their health problems. So it's quite interesting to understand what the difference is. Obviously they're in an enclosed space and they can't actually go anywhere, but there must be more social reasons to it than just, you know, they are interested just because they're in prison. This year's Men's Health Week, which has been run by the Men's Health Forum in June, is focused on men's mental health. And there's no surprise. At the moment we're in the middle of a prolonged recession and if you look at Greece, if you look at Ireland, if you look at the countries that are struggling around Europe, what we're seeing is this big increase in suicides and we're seeing that starting to emerge here. If you look at the data on suicide, the numbers have increased in their hundreds over the last few years and we are so vulnerable Men are so vulnerable when it comes to their mental health. People don't realise this. 
But a lot of lads are just not socialized to recognize their emotions. They're not socialized to talk about their emotions or certainly not recognized to deal with them. And whereas for women there is a, a conversation they can have with their friends or they feel so much more comfortable going and talking to it with the health professionals, these men so often keep it inside, hide it away. And this comes out in, sometimes it comes out as more drinking, it comes out as work starting to, to suffer, it comes out as, even it can come out as domestic violence. But the end for a lot of men is suicide. Last year, two and a half thousand men killed themselves. And that's just in the 15 to 64 age range. Now, if you think about the fact that last year, in that 15 to 64 age range, there was only about a thousand men that died on the roads. That's transport accidents total. Then you realize that you've got over double the number of men who are killing themselves than died on the roads. And yet we have this big um, national uh, fervor around preventing road traffic accidents. And yet we're seeing very little in the way of support for men who seem to be so vulnerable to suicide. We don't know an enormous amount about how to work effectively with men um, for a variety of reasons. The research base uh, is not as good as it might be, but the organisation I work for has run a number of projects in recent years looking at how we might work more effectively with men. And there have been lots of small projects happening all over the country uh, which have tried to target men, some of which, the, some of the most credible ones, in fact, which have happened up here in the northwest of England, particularly in, on Merseyside, in fact, in Sefton. Some of you will know the work that's gone on there and some of the work in uh, Knowsley in the in the past. And there are other parts of the country, Coventry, for example, have got dedicated male health uh, specialists in their PZT as was, and they, and they have a, an ongoing programme about improving men's health in Coventry. There's been a lot of work in Bradford and also in, there's been some work in Newcastle. So this stuff isn't written up academically uh, in the detail it might be, but we've learnt some things about how we might work more effectively with men. And I'm just going to go and try and talk you through these. It, at first sight, this looks really quite funny. Uh, you know, that women are quite complicated. Uh, they, you know, lots of, they're very sophisticated um, and so on. And men are kind of simple binary creatures. We're either on or we're off. Um, and that's the way to deal with. But actually, the, the point I would make here is I don't, I actually don't think this is really true. I think that men are interested in their own health. They can be engaged about their own health. They just think about it differently. Just because men typically won't go out and seek help doesn't mean that they aren't sitting at home worrying about their health and wondering what to do about it. And actually, what we need to do, uh, if I just kind of start with this little joke thing, what we need to do is to try to understand what the other controls are on this lower control panel here, um, instead of just saying, well, either men will take some notes of this or they won't. I think there are things that we can, that we can learn. I mean, I could make an assumption about uh, gay men, for example, because uh, I know for, for me as a gay man in my social circle that we do we tend to take care of each other, that we're very aware of our health needs uh, and we kind of tell each other off when we're not kind of pulling our weight in terms of looking after ourselves. So, we, you know, we could make assumptions about heterosexual men. Um, and their lack of uh, ability sometimes to take up services. But I think there's something around, well, actually, if we've got most of the health services made up of women, uh, and have we got services that have been, made, have been designed and been delivered by women, and actually, is there something about getting more men working in the NHS or working in services generally designed by and delivered by men that would be, be easier to engage with men? And do I mean heterosexual men? I don't know. This might be how, particularly when we're talking about health information, health promotion, public health, how we think about men. We think, well, men aren't very motivated about their health. Well, we know that because I've just demonstrated that. We know men are less motivated than women. Consequently, they're less likely to use health services. They don't turn up to public health programmes and so on. Thus, they seem very 
dispiriting group to work with. Uh, you know, they're hard to reach, you've got to make a special effort, they're problematic, we don't know very much about them. And consequently, we're not very interested or we're not very enthused about doing anything about that. And ideally, I think, uh, we should be trying to move towards this kind of model where we've got men who are motivated, they do use services, we think of them as responsive and rewarding, um, and we feel positive about doing something about it. And I think when you look at this little vicious cycle, the point um, at which it's possible for service providers to intervene, because so far we've talked about men's behaviours, but actually, certainly some of the problems around men's youth of health services are not to do with men, they're to do with service provision, they're to do with um, availability of services. I know, obviously, you're all, the women in the room here, I'm obviously a working women, many of you have full-time jobs, and we know that as many men and women are in work in this country, very roughly the, the numbers are equal, but women, men are much more likely to be in full-time work than women, about twice as likely to be in full-time work. Men are three or four times more likely than women to work excessively long hours, and men are more likely to work a long travelling distance away from home and from their GP. Also, I've no evidence for this, but I think it's almost certainly true, that men are more likely to work in the kind of jobs where it's difficult, particularly poorer men, where you can't just simply take time off to go and uh, see about your health. So men are less likely to work in, those kind of men are less likely to work in white collar jobs where you have flexi time and all the rest of it. So there are structural problems around the way we provide health services. There are problems around the way we describe our health services, the way we market our health services. Um, and you'll often see this in literature, you see more photographs. Again, I haven't done this, so this is blind prejudice potentially on my part. But if you look at the, the kind of material which we put out often, there are photographs of, uh, uh, more photographs of women or photographs of women, mothers taking their children to the doctor, not fathers taking their children to the doctor and so on. So there are things that we can change in service provision. Um, and the key is about designing services with men in mind. And I think that's where there have been significant strides in recent years and that we've done quite a lot more going out, talking to men about what it is they want out of services. Why don't they use services? What kind of services would they like to see? But I hope it will improve in coming years. But these are some of the things that we know. Taking services out uh, of clinical settings is helpful for many men, particularly, obviously, for men of working age and men who are in work. I know there's a lot of men out of work. But taking services into workplaces, it's not without its problems. I haven't got time to tell you what those are. But taking services into workplaces is effective for men. Opening hours, which, funnily enough, I just mentioned. Reduction of bureaucracy, making services more streamlined, uh, seems to work uh, well for men. Um, some, of this, some of this stuff has been known quite widely in the private sector for a long time. I mean, it's long been understood, this research in the commercial world, about how long people are prepared to queue, for example, for any particular, uh, any particular thing that they want. And I, I can't remember the data now, but I think it's that women are prepared to queue for twice as long uh, as men for a ticket or whatever it might be. So we know that streamlined, more, less bureaucratic services are better for men. A really, really crucial thing, which I think is quite difficult and challenging, is that one of the things, and I've just done a three-year study for the Department of Health on men's use of bowel cancer screening. Men are less likely to attend for bowel cancer screening, even though all of the material which men and women receive is identical. Men are much less likely, not much less likely, shouldn't exaggerate it, men are less likely to attend than women. Um, for their bowel cancer screening, and yet men, as we've seen, are t more than twice as likely to develop bowel cancer in the age group that we screen. So you think men would want to go and get screened. Um, but in talking to, we ran focus groups and did a randomised postal survey of men, and the biggest influence on men about whether they'll go for health screening is encouragement from their spouse um, or partner, and that for women, that, that was lower down the list. Women cite a whole number of reasons why they might be encouraged to take action around their health. Uh, encouragement from their friends and relatives, you know, uh, posters, stuff in the media, things they've heard on TV. But for men, the biggest single influence is about their spouse or partner. Now, working with, and obviously not all men have partners, and not all men have female partners, but the majority uh, of men, particularly older men, um, have a female partner. Trying to reach men through their 
wives or spouses is quite challenging, I think, because w clearly women don't, well, I'm sure they don't really want to be gatekeepers for male health. And as an organisation, we ourselves believe very much in men taking responsibility for their own health. But there is clearly an issue there which needs to be thought about, that we know that encouragement, uh, being given permission is often what it amounts to, uh, is helpful in encouraging men to seek help. Um, we think that just simply the issuing invitations and appointments, so instead of saying, well, you can drop in and do this, actually sending uh, an appointment uh, helps men, and also male-friendly marketing, which you've touched on briefly already. There have been some very interesting ways tried recently reaching out to men. One of them, one of the biggest, has been Premier League Health. This is where the Premier League were given, was given funding from the Football Foundation through the football pools originally to put a health trainer into 16 of the top flight clubs, 16 elite clubs, including Manchester, United, Manchester City, Liverpool, Everton. And these people then went out into the community and worked with men, either bringing them back into the, the club or going out and working with them in uh, um, community settings. But the important thing was that they were going out specifically to work with men around their health. But it wasn't just about health. It was about getting the men engaged in some kind of physical activity. So therefore it was fun. And they got 10,000 men engaged on this project. We were able to pick up 4,000 on our evaluation. And those 4,000 men, what was fascinating was that they weren't doing it because it was healthy, they were doing it because it was fun. They weren't doing it because they thought they were unhealthy, because though nine out of 10 of them had actually got a cardiovascular risk factor, and eight out of 10 had multiple cardiovascular risk factors, something like eight out of 10 of these guys did not think they had anything wrong with them. They thought they were perfectly healthy. They weren't going to the doctors, they weren't going for um, health checks because they didn't see they were necessary. They also were not picking up on any kind of health promotion material. Remembering that women are fed health promotion material. They're, it's in their magazines, it's in their journals, it is, it is part of women's socialization that health is important. For young lads it's not. So therefore they were growing up just doing what they wanting, eat what they want, drink what they want. They're fine and they're fit and they're able, but actually the data shows they're not fit and able. The actual project was about getting them engaged in some kind of a physical activity. So some of them were doing football, some of them were not fit enough to do football. So therefore they were doing other kinds of physical activity. And some of it was very imaginative. Newcastle was setting up badminton classes at midnight because that's the time when the South Asian taxi drivers and restaurant workers could go to the, to, to the gym. Uh, some of them were setting up uh, it, uh, activities in the gym itself with weights. Some of them were setting up walking, just walking groups. Others were focused more onto the football itself. But the great thing about it was that at the 12-week follow-up, nearly a quarter of the men had dropped down more than one cardiovascular risk factor. They were drinking less, they were smoking less or stopped smoking, they were uh, eating better diets, they were losing weight, the, the, oh, the obese were dropping down into the overweight category. And, and so why, why is this happening? It, it's not because they were being lectured at about their health, they were being given an opportunity to get engaged with their health in an innovative way. And this is actually, I was listening to um, uh, and a, actually an old uh, episode of Desert Island Disc fairly recently on the Ar D Desert Island Disc archive. And this is uh, Bobby Robson um, saying uh, about his wife uh, when he was diagnosed with cancer that he had no intention of going to seek help, didn't even realise he was ill and in fact um, in the programme he says that he would not he would not have survived to take England to the uh, World Cup uh, semi-finals um, if his wife hadn't actually uh, made the appointment for him and that's I think is a very typical um, experience that lots of particularly older men have had. I think perhaps one of the biggest mistakes or maybe even the biggest myths that, that we have out there is that the health of men start when they go to see a health professional. 
the truth couldn't be further from the point here. It actually starts when you communicate with men to get them to be able to see a health professional in, in the first place. And really what we've got to do is go to where men are, for instance, not least in the mosques, the football grounds, wherever men are, especially at work, and enable them to be able to come and see doctors because then when we get them in the room, then we can actually apply all the knowledge and all the experience and all the skills that we have as doctors and as health professionals generally to do something about this problem of men's health. And this is what we've got to do with general practice. We've got to recognise that there's a different psychology taking place here. So actually having, for instance, only female receptionists is a barrier to men to be able to say why they're coming to see um, a doctor in the first place. This is something we can do something about. Men do not worry about the sex of the doctor. They worry about the interface between them and the health professional. All these things are doable, and that's what we can do in general practice. BT realised they had a problem with cardiovascular disease in the workforce, and they wanted to do something about it. So they got in the Men's Health Forum to advise them about how they could deliver a, a behaviour change programme that was open to men and women, but particularly focused on getting the male part of the workforce, the larger part of the workforce, involved. And MHF came up with a uh, very simple but new way of doing this, which was an online uh, program, uh, because the thinking was that men are more likely to, to engage with something that was delivered confidentially uh, to, the, to, to the workers as individuals uh, through an online service. And um, the results were actually quite astonishing. Uh, any employee could sign up to a 16-week program which focused mainly on diet and physical activity. People who signed up uh, were sent an email uh, every Monday morning for 16 weeks uh, and, the, and the email contained a very simple task like when you're having a snack, uh, have a, an apple rather than a bag of crisps, that kind of thing, written in quite blokey language. Uh, the email link to a, 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 a website on the BT intranet which contained more information about what you could do if you wanted to make these changes and provided supporting information. <coughs> when it started, BT had as its benchmark for, benchmark for success getting 5,000 of its staff out of the 90,000 signed up to this. It ended up with 16,500 of its staff, about a fifth of the workforce involved, um, and 75% of them were men, exactly the same proportion as in the overall workforce. And because the whole thing was delivered electronically, uh, it was very easy to get feedback from the participants and to measure what happened to them over the 16 weeks. And it was possible to track 5,000 staff over the 16-week uh, programme. And weight loss was used as the key indicator of success, because we knew that if people change their diet, were more physically active, they'd lose weight. And the average weight loss for the 5,000 who could be measured over 16 weeks was 2.3 kilograms, which for a mass participation, mass participation program with no individual support is actually a very, very good result. And that, was, uh, and that wasn't just a flash in the pan because there was a six month follow up, which showed that for the majority, they either, either maintained the weight loss or lost or went on to lose more weight. We don't really disaggregate data and intelligence of access to services uh, in terms of gender and then break it down further in terms of men, in terms of age and ethnicity, um, sexuality and stuff. So when we're doing targeted um, campaigns and interventions, we're not reaching out to um, uh, many of the men. And a lot of the health um, sort of campaigns um, that are around and more targeted at women because we know more about women um, than we do about men and it's a, so it's a vicious cycle it's because we're not doing we don't have the disaggregated evidence base we can't then commission appropriately so services are tailor-made to their needs and we don't um, then target initiatives as well. Well, to tackle these big problems in men's health, the NHS needs to do a number of things. I think at the overall strategic level, what's needed is a new approach to inequalities. I think that over the years, the NHS and government have seen health inequalities as primarily being an issue about socioeconomics, social class, 
And that's obviously a very, very important part of the picture. The gender hasn't been taken nearly as seriously. And the interrelationship between gender inequalities and, health in and socioeconomic inequalities hasn't been properly understood or developed or thought through. Um, and I think unless we look at these two things together, we're not going to get to the end point that we all want, which is improved health for men and women. Um, now, I think the Marmot report, fantastic though it was, uh, did, a, did us a slight disservice by focusing just on the socioeconomic inequalities. And Michael Marmot himself, since he wrote that report, has acknowledged that he should have included gender as part of his analysis. And he's gone on to do that in work he's done looking at the social determinants of health across Europe. But I think we now need to um, add in the level of gender into the fantastic work that Michael Marmot did and to make sure that's embedded into the inequalities work that's, that's done throughout the NHS and beyond. I think also when we're talking about gender, we have to um, understand very clearly that gender is not just about women's health. Um, and I think we've moved a long way in that direction. But for a lot of people still, when you talk about gender, it's understood just to be about half the picture, which is what happens to women. Now, that's perfectly understandable um, that, you know, historically, women campaign very vociferously for changes to health services and health policy, um, and men didn't do that. And that's one of the reasons why we're, we've got some of the problems that we have, because men haven't really got their act together and campaigned for the changes that are needed. But I think that um, although overall in society women do worse than men, um, so it's quite it's also, which is also helps to explain why the emphasis has been on women, um, that ignores in health the much more, a much more complicated picture, which is that both men and women do badly in different ways. And it's not a competition between men and women as to who's doing worse, but we need to look at the needs and experiences of both sexes separately as well as jointly. I think it's very important that the new clinical commissioning groups start to think about what they can do uh, to uh, help men, much more than is happening in primary care, uh, particularly at the moment. And I think uh, clinical commissioning groups are charged to, with the, um, one of the key outcomes is to reduce premature mortality. We know that men are much more likely to die young, to die prematurely, than women. So if any part of the NHS, but here we're talking about CCGs, if they're serious about reducing premature mortality, they've got to do something about men's health. They also have a responsibility to tackle inequalities. Now that's not just about socioeconomic inequalities, although they're extremely important. It's also about gender, and that includes men. It's also about race, sexual orientation, and so on. Now, as part of that responsibility, they have to think about what they can do for men, as well as all the other uh, disadvantaged groups in terms of health. So what can we do at a policy level? The um, National Chlamydia Screening Programme, which some of you may be familiar with, um, th chlamydia is a, as, a, as an infection is as common in men as it is in women. Um, I think it's very, very slightly, but very roughly it's um, as common in men as it is in women. Clearly, it's of much, much greater significance for the health of women than it is for the health of men. Um, and when the National Chlamydia Screening Programme began back in 2004, I think 2003, um, the take-up of opportunistic screening by men was very much lower than it was by young women, and for fairly obvious reasons. Um, but clearly, if you're going to address uh, a sexually transmitted infection, which is as common in, in men as it is in women, we as an organisation think you can't simply give women the responsibility for doing something about that, treating chlamydia infection, and then therefore not passing it on to men. You've got to work with men as well, uh, because you're not otherwise you're not encouraging men to take responsibility for their own health. You're reinforcing the idea uh, that the NHS is a service for women. And there's an interesting thing. We did a big research programme years ago about chlamydia, and m we talked to... We talked to students, we ran focus groups of students and focus groups of soldiers to ask them about their, um, their uh, knowledge and experience of um, STIs. And these almost, without exception, 
even though these were quite different groups, the squaddies and the students, that it, in terms of avoiding an STI for men, it was about avoiding the kind of woman it might give you an STI. So the idea is, you know, that somehow women, you know, the blame is if, if we don't start to say, well, men have got to take responsibility for their sexual health, then we're also, I think, risking blaming women for STIs if we say, well, it's about, uh, it's about women identifying STIs and having themselves treated. So um, we lobbied really quite hard to the National Chlamydia Screening Programme back uh, around 2003, 2004, and they decided to uh, produce some material initially looking at how to work effectively with young men and they commissioned a working group which I was on uh, and, very, and people like Brooke and the FPA and so on as well and they ended up with this uh, guide which was issued to all the local officers about how to work effectively with young men and then subsequently a sort of broad overarching policy guide and subsequently and I think I can't remember the year now at 2007 2008 they issued the second guide here to practical things you can do to encourage more men to take up chlamydia screening. So it's essentially a kind of marketing exercise, prioritising working with men in, in your planning and so on. And if you look at this, you'll see that in the first year of the National Chlamydia Screening Programme, 7% uh, of those who were screened were young men. Uh, by 2008, 2009, after the introduction of these policy initiatives, you see this massive increase up to almost a third uh, of young people screened uh, were male. And actually last year, it went up again to 36.6%. So I, I choose it, I mean, I think there aren't that many examples, but I choose this as a kind of national level example of where if you prioritise and plan for engaging with men, you can actually do it. It's about taking that decision that this is something you want to do. That's it, I think. Thank you. Historically, most men, most GPs have been male. Now, that's changing, and this may change this whole playing field. But historically, most GPs have been men. And, of course, they bring their own cultural preconceptions um, into the surgery. And I think it is perfectly probable that many GPs have a different attitude to men, a less sympathetic attitude to male patients than they do to women. Um, I think that may particularly be true around psychological health. So, so there you've got something very, very difficult going on. It's difficult for a man to admit his vulnerability in the first place, and then he's got to admit that to another man who maybe isn't as sympathetic as he would like. And I think, I've never seen anything to prove this, but I think it'd be a very interesting piece of research. When we design health information materials, we tend to assume that pe people will pick these up and read them because they're interested in their health. So we write stuff, helpful, useful, beautifully written stuff that says, you know, this, these are some things you can try. If you want to build more exercise into your life, you could try this. If you want to change your diet, you could try it. So we write all this stuff because we think once we've written it, it's incredibly useful, stuff people don't know, and they'll act on it. But actually, some groups of people are more likely to read it and act on it than others. And so, and clearly, you know, that is more likely to be women than men. So I think there is something about an assumption, making an assumption uh, that people are interested in their health, which does inevitably cause a bias, inadvertent bias towards women. Because if you assume that by putting this stuff out, people will be interested in it, you're all, you're, what you're doing is you're already focusing on women by default. And I said at the beginning, we have to generalise about groups of men. And I, I did do a bit of talking about better off men and less well off men, but clearly many of these things vary by, uh, by your sexual orientation, by your, your racial origin and so on. These, these things are different across different cultures, and I should make, perhaps have made that more clear, but obviously I didn't have time to talk about that in, um, today. I, the thing about give, give, being given permission is important to a man, because the thing is it gets you over that hurdle of I shouldn't really be seeking this help because it's not very manly. But if somebody says to you, you should really go and sort that out. It gives you something to say, pathetic as this may be sounds, but at least you can go and say, well, look, I wouldn't be here, but, you know, my daughter absolutely insisted I come. I know I'm wasting time, she made me come. But really, my gut feeling is that there probably there are men out there who really wanted somebody to take that uh, step uh, and push them into doing it. And that may be true also in the victim support thing, I think. We established the Bowel Cancer Screening Programme. It has been a success. It could be an even bigger success, but it's been a success. What we knew was we were going to have to get people to take part in the Bowel Cancer Screening Programme, one of the biggest killers of both women and men in the United Kingdom. 
And we know by early diagnosis we can save these lives. The problem was how could we get them to engage to take part in it? When we asked women what was the most important thing which would stop them from taking part in the bowel cancer screening program, they said embarrassment. Almost to a woman said embarrassment of the process, okay? Fecal occult in a tube, send off to the, to the testers. When we asked men what was the single biggest barrier for them taking part, it was the fear of the diagnosis. How can you possibly give out information to both sexes when one says the barrier is embarrassment and the other one says the fear of diagnosis? You have to target them separately to get the united effort to be able to get them to take part. I think there's also a clear financial benefit in uh, seeing men sooner in primary care, uh, diagnosing men sooner and treating them sooner. If you take a condition like diabetes, which if left undiagnosed for a long time can lead to very severe complications. We know that if we can get to people earlier, we will save money. So if we can get men into the health checks earlier, if we can get men to recognize their symptoms sooner and to go and see the doctor sooner, uh, I think that would actually save the NHS um, a great deal of money. If men manage to live to 65, then actually their chances of getting to 70, 80, 90 increase dramatically because they've, they've missed out on a lot of the fatal illnesses earlier on. So we want those men to be getting to that age as fit and able as possible so that they can enjoy their older years and not be a burden on society. One of the things I think we really do badly is with men is that we wish men. We wish men were more like women. We wish men would come to see us sooner. We wish men would read more about, about health information. So in other words, we don't deal with men as they are. We wish they were like something that we wish they were. My recommendation would be very simple. Just accept men the way they are at the moment. We can do all our social engineering later, but let's just deal with what we have. If men like, for instance, to be able to read a manual type approach towards, towards health, like a car manual, for instance, where in it, it doesn't say you must read about the carburetor before you fix the exhaust pipe. If there's nothing wrong with the carburetor, they won't do it. If they actually can open reading material which is pertinent and relevant to the way they live, and the way they think, and the way that it impacts upon their lives and upon the lives of people they love, they are much more likely to do something about it. And that's what we've found. When we did the Haynes manuals, for instance, which looked like car manuals, my generation of men took to them immediately. They were best sellers. They worked. We evaluated them. They got men to do something about it. Rather than wishing that men were some other kind of creature, why don't we just use their psychology to their advantage instead of A, criticising them all the time for being a man. It's your fault because you're fat, you're lazy and you own a chromosome which is called Y. Why don't we just say you are what you are, we're going to deal with you where you are to your advantage. That could be the key to overcoming some of the barriers we have at the moment of men's use of services. So even though, for example, men are more likely to be overweight or obese than women, uh, in terms of national policy on obesity, there's virtually nothing there about gender differences. It's as if those, those differences don't exist. And the same would be true of cardiovascular disease. In other areas, it's been very hard to make an impact, even though many more men die of uh, cardiovascular disease uh, than women, and particularly at a younger age. So what we need to do is to find a way of driving change across all these big policy areas. We have, what's helped us in recent years has been the equality legislation and the Equality Act, or the, the two Equality Acts. Um, and that's, that has helped, that certainly has helped. But again, it hasn't been the effective driver for change that we hoped when that legislation first passed. It has resulted in something very patchy, uh, some areas, like the North West, actually have done better than others in responding to uh, the spirit of the legislation. Um, but we can't rely just on that. I think something else that would help here would be looking at the possibility of having a national men's health policy. Now, this has been introduced in uh, Australia and in Ireland. And we know that in both those countries, 
uh, it has actually resulted in the health services there uh, paying much more attention to men's health issues. I think the other thing that we need to do uh, strategically, at the strategic level, is to um, uh, do more to actually, um, it's very hard to kind of find a way of doing this, but to actually make it a much more, men's health much more of a political issue. Women's health has been driven far more by grassroots campaigning activity, women organising themselves to demand the changes that have been needed to improve women's health. We've seen nothing like that in men's health. It's been entirely a professional, professionally led uh, campaign uh, so far. And that's, that's fantastic. It's fantastic that there are people who are enthusiastic about it and want to do things. Uh, but in, politicians listen to what people tell them. Um, and if, people are, if ordinary people are demanding change, it's more likely to happen than if a bunch of doctors or public health professionals tell them that it's, it's a good idea. So I think one, one of the big challenges for those of us who are active in this field is to find ways of actually encouraging uh, uh, individuals locally and nationally, men and women who care about men, to stand up and say, this is not acceptable, that so many men die young is not acceptable anymore, we have to do something about it and challenge the politicians to actually start introducing the policies that are needed. And men's health is one of these areas that you can look at public health from a primary care setting and say, if we can get men to be diagnosed early with the big killers of men, the cardiovascular disease, the cancers, the type 2 diabetes, if we can get them to come early to us, then we as health professionals can get better satisfaction and know we've done a job well done working on a public health basis. That's the key to getting people involved. Don't shout at them, don't patronise them and don't diminish their professional insight and respect for themselves. Enhance it and give them the tools. Give them the tools, they'll do the job. No tools, no job. The Men's Health Forum was set up in 1994 and since then we've seen a huge change in the way that men's health is understood as an issue um, in the UK and internationally in fact. And it would be foolish to say there haven't been improvements in the way that men's health is now dealt with. Still a long way to go but things are moving slowly in the right direction. Um, we now have a language to talk about men's health. Before the 1990s men's health wasn't really understood as a concept. People didn't really talk about men's health as an issue that needed to be addressed. When, in the early years, men's health was seen to be just about urology, just about men's dangly bits, and we know now that it's much more complicated than that, that really there's a men's health dimension to almost any, uh, any health problem or issue that you can think of, whether that's cardiovascular disease, obesity, or how men use, or how men and women use services. All these issues uh, can be looked at uh, through the lens of gender. Um, we uh, also now have changes, we have changes in policy uh, which are beginning to take account of men. We've seen not enough but changes in some areas which are beginning to make a difference and um, there have been in various parts of the country, particularly in the northwest I have to say, where um, services have tried to reach out to address men's problems and we've seen projects in places like Sefton, Knowlesley, Halton for example that have really seriously, there's been a serious effort made to tackle um, health problems of men uh, in the most disadvantaged groups. That's still very patchy across the country but we can build on uh, what we've learned from those local projects in the northwest and elsewhere. I think a key uh, development was uh, in 2009 when the Department of Health uh, appointed the Men's Health Forum to be one of its strategic partners uh, alongside about a dozen other uh, charities. And that was an indication that the Department of Health was beginning to take men's health more seriously and wanted to hear from the Men's Health Forum about what it needed to do uh, to tackle men's issues uh, more effectively. So we've seen uh, slowly changes and movement in the right direction. What we've got to do as the NHS enters a period of change or continues on a period of change and transformation with new structures being set up, that we don't lose what we've gained. There's a danger of that as people move on, as uh, policies change, that men's health will slip back again. But there's obviously now an opportunity to get men's health embedded 
uh, in the new national organisations like the NHS Commissioning Board and Health Promotion England, uh, and also locally in the clinical commissioning groups, health and wellbeing boards and so on, get men's health established at the outset in these new organisations um, so um, the problems can continue to be dealt with in the right way.